Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you're joining us. Uh, thank you for joining today for our Case Spears first ever expert advice webinar. I'm Gabriela Cabero, the CEO and co founder of Case Spear. And we were founded with the vision of technology powering personal injury law firms from intake to settlement. And we really wanted to help law firms be more successful businesses. And with expert advice, I'm really looking forward to sitting down with people who've achieved success in their industries to share their experience and their insights. So to kick it off, I'm so excited to welcome Glenn Lerner and Kevin Rowe of Lerner and Rowe. Lerner and Rowe, you may have heard of them, is one of the largest personal injury firms in the country with brand dominant offices in Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, Albuquerque, and Chicago. And recently they were named number two most influential advertising firm by national trial lawyers. They've grown from a one man shop in Las Vegas 30 years ago to nearly 400 employees in 20 offices nationwide. So welcome Kevin and Glenn, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. All right, well, to kick it off, Glenn, what was it like when you first started your firm in Vegas all those well, years ago? Humble beginnings. Gee whiz, I came to Vegas in 1990. All I had was a, a Cannondale uh, 10 speed. And uh, my first office wasn't even an office, it was a converted garage. I was 7, 13 and a half, sub seven. My aspiration at the time was to eventually get into the main building. So I eventually became 7, 13, <laughs> sub seven. But, um, well, you know, it's so true because I think young lawyers will look at firms like yours thinking, I can never do that. And what would you say to them? I think it's like anything else in life. I think you just put one foot in front of the other and you keep just keep looking forward. And oh gosh, you can't look in the rear view too much. You keep looking forward. And I think you have to have a vision for what you want. Um, you can't get complacent and, you know, it's not for everybody. You know, I remember, um, you know, I remember when our we had just started advertising maybe a year or two into advertising and I, one of the attorneys in Vegas came up to me and said, man, I see you advertising so much now. How much is your monthly, uh, your monthly nut? I said, I don't know, 300,000 a month. He said, oh my God, how do you sleep at night? I said, I've never thought about it once. And so I think that's what it really is. Are you risk averse or not? You mm -hmm. know, if you're not a risk averse person, I'm a totally non risk averse person. Um, and I believe in myself then I guess it's something that you can try. If you are scared, and if that's the type of question you're asking yourself, well, I can't go to sleep at night because I'm thinking about the debt, then you know it's not for you, go work for somebody. You know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Gosh, we couldn't be where we are. Well, Kevin, you're raising your hand. Maybe that's what makes you guys a great team. <laughs> I, I think that absolutely does. See, um, there's a little bit of difference. You know, Glenn had his practice started when he was half a space um, back in the days he was talking about. When I came along, he had a full space. He made a full number at this time. But if you, uh, if any of you know Las Vegas, and I would be saying North Las Vegas, not Las Vegas Strip as we all know it, um, that was our first building that I was in that had a full address that shared a La Carniceria Mexican meat market next door and then two doors down from the methadone clinic uh, that was there. <laughs> and even inside, we didn't have walls that went all the way up to the ceiling. They actually went up and left three-foot gapes you know, for each offices, uh, very was small. Your office next to the bathroom. That is correct. See, I was so excited when I actually started working with Glenn. He goes, "Look, you can have my office." And I left that meeting going, "Oh my God, I get the owner's office. This is so fantastic!" Mind you, for the last five years prior to this, off and on, I was working at a large insurance defense firm in Newport Beach, overlooking you know, some beautiful views. So I cannot wait to see what I'm getting to get, use the owner's office. And I can tell you this, I was a bit taken back. I was a bit in awe. And then as you open up the door, it wouldn't even open all the way because there's not enough room that, that he had to get <laughs> in there that the door wouldn't open or close all the way. It was um, amazingly crazy. Um, um, but the humble beginnings we had and where we started and what I was able to learn and we learned together, uh, I wouldn't change it for anything. And it absolutely was an awesome time period for us. So, Kevin, when you started, uh, at, or I guess originally, then uh, was it Learner and Associates, or what was uh, what was the firm back then? What was it originally called? I think we had, it was Budget Legal when he first started with me. And then, wow. Um, okay. I had uh, for my first seven years of practice from '91 to '98, I'd been doing a little bit of everything. I was making probably upwards of 30 court appearances a week, doing divorces, DUIs, name changes. You name it, I did it. But I learned mm -hmm. 
court system. Every judge knew me. I've done a lot of jury trials. And I realized um, I was terrible at charging people. I did a murder trial for $3,000. Um, I just wasn't good. I couldn't charge people. You know, I grew up actually because I grew up with a father in jail for double murder. And so it was very difficult for me to charge people. And then I, I we had a couple personal injury cases. And I realized we had these signed contracts. And when the check came, it came to us. <laughs> and we were in control of the money. I have to beg people to pay me. I said, I like this. Mm -hmm. And so we started to look at doing our personal injury. And by chance, one of the girls that was working with us in the, the place next to the carniceria, it was actually a tortoise place mm -hmm. um, and the methadone clinic. Um, <laughs> she had worked for an attorney named Brian Longcar out of Dallas, who was one of the biggest attorneys in Dallas. And she said, you know what, Brian's on TV a lot and he's got, he's been doing this stuff, one call, that's all. And that's been incredibly successful him, for him. I think it would work for you. Why don't you come down and meet him? So I went down, got, you know, got some forms, got some retainers and learned how to do a few little things. He was really kind to me. And that's why I love talking on webinars like this. I love imparting any knowledge we can, because obviously we just want people to be better at what they do, because ultimately we're here just to serve people. You know, we want to... In the communities, all our attorneys and people that we work with or share with, we're just representing people. We want you to be the best you can be and learn from our mistakes, you know, you know short learning curve. And there was a lot of them. Absolutely. And that's why that's why it's hard expertise now, because we made about every mistake in the book, but we have learned from them. And so, you know, when we talk to some of you people out there that maybe been practicing just a few years, you know, that's what we're hoping. We can shorten the learning curve. If you want to reach out to us and say hi, we're always looking to talk to people, not transactional, like, oh, I want to get something. We love relating with people. It's incumbent upon us to really reach out and teach younger attorneys. Nevertheless, um, you know, when you had this, this practice over there, it was, it was a different type of practice. And I realized, you know, our first month advertising, I spent $10,000. I got 66 new car accident clients. I was like, oh my God, I think we hit something. <laughs> don't you wish it was like that these days? Oh I don't know. God. $66 <laughs> per sign case back then. Wow, mm. it's a different, yeah. a different world now, that's for sure. Oh, it, I, it'd be me and Jeff Bezos if it was just those, those <laughs> numbers. Man, crazy. So I have a question. When you talk to, to business owners and people that have seen a lot of success over the years, a lot of times they might have this moment, like this conscious decision that they leaned in to change, leaned into growth. Do you guys have a moment for either of you that really represents that looking back? I think that's more me to answer because Kevin, you know, he and I, mean, I love Kevin. He's like my, he's my little brother, basically. I mean, I think we just have an incredibly close relationship and I have such a mutual respect. We've had our moments over 23 years, but, um, you know, we joke, he's been with me a couple months longer than I've been with my wife and he likes to tell everybody that. Um, but the truth is you need people that balance each other. And, you know, the thing is I'm kind of the always, 100 miles an hour, push it, grow, 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 expand, buy, do, sell, take the chance. Mm -hmm. Heaven's much more the breaks. And you need that. I mean, I would, it would be complete self destruction if it were just up to me. But one of the, I think the, I will give myself one compliment. I'm smart enough to know that. I know that I need people around me, uh, Kevin and our CFO, Jeff Cahill, that say no. I need people that can say no to me sometimes. Ultimately, I'm going to override them. <laughs> if I want to do it, I'm going to do it. But nine times out of ten, I'm going to listen. And I think mm -hmm. it's been the biggest reason we have done well is because we have an incredible balance that very few firms have. He's mm -hmm. micro, a macro. He's the, mm -hmm. I mean, the best in the United States of what he does. No one in America is better than that man on the screen at running the day-to-day -day of a law office. I don't care who's out there. I've met one other guy in the United States at, at his level, but Kevin does this better than anybody. And it lets me do what I do. I see the big picture. I have the relationships nationwide. I develop my mass towards practice. I look for areas for growth. And I'm the guy who goes out and I'm, I'm in this different cities all the time, you know, with the people in the office shedding love, you know, giving, you know, mm -hmm. just daddy. People need to see the captain of the ship. I'm daddy, you know, and that's, it's kind of like mom and dad in a way too, because he's the mom who's always home with everybody. And everybody gets in with the mom. No, no, no. And I come in whenever I walk in the office. I love it. Daddy's home. And but, everybody's laughing and it's fun. I'm throwing the football over people's heads. We're having fun. And he kicks me out of the office almost all the time. <laughs> it's getting so, 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 Kevin, what, 
So Kevin, you you joined the firm as an associate. Uh, you had shared with me that at one point prior to that, you'd even thought about leaving law. I mean, what was that like? Yeah, so, you know, and then recommitting yeah. to where you are today. Yeah. So when we first started, it was actually a, a weird time in my life that um, I had worked at this large insurance defense law firm. I had done it in high school. Um, uh, the partner I was a mentor of mine. And then I ended up going to his same law school. Um, when I got done and you got to figure three years of law school, some undergraduate, four years, three and a half years of that. And then working, um, you know, on and off of the breaks that I had in high school, you know, that's six years plus of uh, six, seven years that you get a chance to see things and, and decide. And that was the one thing that I think I got to see too, is the billable hours that insurance defense attorneys do. And it makes it so much nicer to be on this side of the game, but it gives you uh, respect for your time and the time is money and what you need to be able to do what you want to accomplish with your time. But at that time, uh, living in California, that's where I'm from. I went to law school in Los Angeles and it was uh, 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 when you got offered a salary position, it makes you really think twice when you have $140,000 in law school loans. And uh, my joke is I always say is that I had a I had enough for uh, after you pay X and Y, I had enough for um, uh, a 99 cent uh, burrito at Taco Bell, but they didn't even have those back then. They were a buck 29 at the time. So you really had nothing. Um, so I got kind of burned out. And instead I went ahead and looked at the fundraising realm um, and started to help out people um, and teams in where I grew up in fundraising activities. So if it was cheerleaders or football or soccer or, or uh, you know, elementary school kids or ASB. It was I really great. Help I believe help out your son, cheerleaders. <laughs> Probably. Uh, but no, uh, it was really an opportunity to actually get out and help them accomplish their dreams. And I honestly believe to this day, as I look back, um, that experience was, I think, one of those things that we, or at least I absolutely carry into what we do now. Um, we have a great firm. We, it took a lot of hard work to do that, but we also have a fantastic foundation. I know we're going to talk about it later, but that's what Glenn and I 100% agree on all the time and how can we serve others it doesn't like he said have to be transactional how can we do it outside of the legal arena or a profession and that's learner real gives back and i think the days of uh having the ability of to raise uh funds for all these different organizations back then um uh, enabled me to uh, be able to do that more and have more ability to, to do that and then it comes to the point that I had friends, mutual friends, well, actually a Glenn's client at the time that says, what are you doing with your life? For me in California at that time, it was great. Um, he goes, come meet my attorney. And that's the probably the, the greatest experience that took place there. Um, we had the opportunity to meet. I bring all my files and motions I've ever written, uh, pleadings I've ever done. And I met Glenn uh, at a bar, which actually at that time was a judge's bar in Las, in Las Vegas. Um, brought all my stuff and he says, you want a job? And I was like, yeah, great. Do you want to see all my stuff around? He goes, no, put that stuff away. I don't want to see any of that stuff. Um, and it started then. And then we already went into the humble beginnings of the wonderful office that he gave me and all that fun stuff. But uh, you had mentioned, do I think, is there, or does Glenn think, or I think there's a particular time that I knew um, things were going to go a little bit different. And I wanted to kind of hit that. I think Glenn will agree with it. Sure, getting 66 cases and spending $10,000 um, at that time. But I think there was that also a point in time that the largest advertising attorney in Las Vegas at that time decided to go run for Senate. And if you remember this back then, Glenn, it was one of those things that he decided to go make that run. And I think it was an opportunity that Glenn filled the void of some humor in the commercial. It was 1998 when we started, August of 1998. Within, uh, within six months, we were the number three advertising in the market we were number two behind this guy when he started his senate run and once he did that he couldn't advertise during uh you know obviously because of prohibitions from advertising while you're running for office we completely took over the market never looked back mm -hmm. and you know certainly that was uh an opportunity for us but i think in terms of actual growth you know once we took over and we were dominant in the vegas office um, I think there are very few law firms that have ever dominated the market the way we did, especially in the early to mid 2000s. Um, and in 2005, you know, I guess because of the you know, type of person I am, you know, we were doing very well for ourselves. We were having a lot of fun. We had a great group of people. And um, I said, man, you can only get so big. This, this TV market's the, the 40th biggest TV market in the country. It's, you know, it's a second tier market. You know, let's prove we're not just one hit wonders. 
You know, I, I didn't want to be a ha. I didn't want to just be that, that band with that one famous song. I said, let's go try another market. I said, go, go, go get licensed in Arizona. I'll make you a partner. And um, so Kevin got licensed in Arizona in uh, 2005. We opened up in Bullhead City, which was close close enough to be an Arizona presence. And a year later, we opened up in Phoenix. And, uh, you know, by uh, about 2010, 2011, we really took over the Phoenix market. And, uh, you know, then if, once Phoenix, we became number one in Phoenix and we were cash flowing positively, I said, okay, we've done it here and there. Let's prove we can do it one of the biggest markets in the country. So we went to Chicago and it's been kind of the same thing. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you have a model. I think once you have the model and you have a culture, I think it's just expanding or contracting your will. You know, as, and as, and how did you guys decide which market you'd go into next? What was that process like? Well, I think for Arizona was just a not Arizona was almost like a sister market. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the same for same for Albuquerque too. Absolutely, mm -hmm. they, but all Southwest they share a lot of the same law. The only, I guess, maybe one of my few regrets is that we didn't go into Los Angeles at the time instead of Chicago, mm -hmm. only for the fact that the three cities almost form a triangle. I mean, there's, I mean, there, there's such a connection, such a symbiotic relationship, especially between Vegas and uh, Greater LA. I mean, roughly fifty percent of the visitors to Las Vegas come from mm -hmm. California. And so I think our brand, the brand awareness we would have brought with us would have been significant. And same thing with Phoenix is such a connection. So be, there's a triangle and it's, you know, such a large, a large area. So, you know, I, th I think that's something that I regret, but I'm not going to worry about that. You know, we've had enough business in California is spillover. We've been very blessed and uh, there's only so much you can do. Mm hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so one of the things I want to dig into, because obviously K-Spear, we're a tech company. Uh, was there a specific, um, is there, so you guys have always both been adopters of technology very early on, even, I mean, 20 years back, you were on what was most cutting edge at the time. What role do you feel technology has played in the success of your firm? And Kevin, I, maybe this is a question more for you on the operation side, but Glenn, of course, uh, opportunity for you to answer as well well uh yeah i think technology 100 has made us more efficient uh has <laughs> made us, uh more transparent with management but also help people accountable um and those are the three i think major issues that technology has presented to us that are that have made us um, um where we are today so you talked about a previous software that we had it was state-of-the-art back then and we thought it was it was a big investment for us back then um, we thought it was great and we kind of stuck with it, but then we realized after 18 years um, that we weren't able to get what we needed out of it. And so we actually started looking um, at other uh, platforms that may be out there. And of course, we ended up going with Casebeer and there's numerous reasons why we chose Casebeer, the reporting or the dashboards or the ease of use um, um, are all different areas of why we really liked it over uh, all the other software uh, platforms that are out there. Um, I can tell mm -hmm. you, you know, there was also another platform that, I, you know, as Glenn just said, we're not going to cry over spilled milk and, and put our feet to the fire that we didn't do this or didn't do that or should have done this or that. That's part of us. You know, we've we've made a lot of mistakes over the years. And if you're not making mistakes and you're not trying, you know, you're not actually trying to push yourself forward. And the one thing that I know uh, went back in the day, this goes all the way back um, to 98. You know, Glenn had asked me at one time, hey, you know, will you look over the company? why I'm traveling and doing stuff. And my one quite, my one statement to him was absolutely, not that I have any idea what I'm doing, because I don't, um, um, but just have my back. And, and he looked at me straight and he goes, absolutely, of course I'll have your back. And if you want to fast forward, you know, 23 years later, um, it's the same. You know, have my back, I've got your back. We're going to make mistakes. We want to continue to grow and continue to get better. You're going to make mistakes if you have that. If you want to continue pushing the envelope, you're going to make mistakes. You know, no one's perfect. We gotta be able to learn from that. So there's one platform we looked at was an intake platform. And for years I was like, we should do it, but I'm not spending that money. I'm not gonna spend that kind of money. And and long story short is when we finally made the commitment to go do it, um, that was another technology move that the first 30 days, it held everybody accountable. And we realized that there are 50 plus cases in that first month 
that would have fallen through the cracks had it not been for this new software. So we can go, oh my God, let's look back 50, 50, 50, 50, 30, whatever it may be. Uh, but instead, you look to the future, you look to forward and realize that it's keeping everybody accountable. It's keeping everybody uh, organized. Um, um, and that's key too. And it's making the process hopefully more efficient for us, which is a better experience for the client ultimately at the end. I mean, that's what you want at the end of the day. You want the client to feel that the process is efficient moving them through this. And so hopefully they focus on one thing. And the only thing we want our clients to focus on is, is to get better. We'll handle everything else. You know, let me interject for a second. So, you know, one of the things a lot of times when I speak to a lot of attorneys, you know, they want to hear about how to improve their practice and stuff. I'll ask them a few simple questions, you know, besides how many cases you're signing up a month, but what's your average case acquisition cost? Okay, the guys just like look at me, they can't answer. And what's your average fee per case? I mean, because those are the two those are the two most important metrics. How much does it cost to acquire a case and how much do you get from a case? You get a spread there, then you throw in all your other costs and stuff, and you know whether or not you can be profitable or not. And you can't if you can't um, quickly spill out the the most important metrics of your business, then you're it's like flying an airplane, you know, without radar. Gosh, mm -hmm. so one of the things we were, you know, really, really upfront with you guys about was the need to have really strong analytical uh, abilities with the software. And I think you've been more than willing to really keep just keep improving, keep adding more and more, more, more little uh, bobbles and trinkets in there. To, oh, oh, always, always improving. Yeah. But to that point too, it's not just the business owner, right? It's also putting those uh, tools in the hands of your case managers, your attorneys to individually manage their teams so that they and their own caseloads. So they know how many cases they have, how many of their cases they've touched in the last seven days and things like that. I know you guys have a policy of calling a client back within 24 hours and things like that. And you've got to know if that's been done. And absolutely. And I think that comes to the accountability portion of uh, all of case beer. I mean, having the tasks, having automated tasks um, um, and having the ability to track and make sure those things are done, be able to uh, run reports on everything. And obviously client communication, last client communication is something that's very significant to us. Um, Cause at the end of the day, we want to provide the best service we can to the clients that have blessed or honored us with the ability to represent them or allowing us to represent them. So uh, 100%. I think that's um, that's what's been really great is when you talk about accountability and you talk about these efficiencies, you got to have the policies and procedures in place as well. And I know I've been at a lot of these seminars. Everybody talks about setting policies in place. Make sure you do that. Um, and it's great to have that in place. I think at the end of the day, too, you have to have the willingness to not be static and always ever be changing if you want to improve and, and continue to move forward. So we have policies, obviously, and procedures in place. We tweak them all the time, um, trying to see what can be the best for our staff, of course, and, and the best way we can serve our clients. So uh, I think Case Bears was has really enabled us to dial those things in um, and making sure that we have that accountability with running these reports and making sure we're doing everything that we need to be doing, especially we just had a we're coming out of a pandemic. No one ever thought that we we're going to have this. And having software like this helps us make sure we're able to communicate with our staff in remote locations and obviously have the accountability and making sure the efficiencies are still running that way. And that's what you're able to do with the reporting and everything with Case Bear. Mm -hmm. So that part's really about you need everybody to buy in. And that's, been, that's been, you know, some of our offices have been in, they've, they've uh, they've been de dangling their, their toes in the water. Phoenix and Tucson have really, really been immersed in it. Uh, Chicago's part in, yeah. and so it's really getting everybody to do it the same way. Because you know, um, as owners, you always want a software that's going to allow you to be able to, you know, have the analytics mm -hmm. touch of a button, and to obviously yeah. the accountability that this software has. You know, unfortunately, this kind of pits the owners against the employees because employees hate accountability. They'll tell you they don't, but no one likes being accountable and having every missed call documented, every every time they're not putting in notes documented because they know it's, you know, at some point enough enough documentation is going to be a termination. You know? and I think well, that's and 
you know, to, to that point, I will say, you know, we've got some questions and, and for those of you, please continue to put them in. I'll, I'll get to them as, as we can during this conversation. You know, well, one of the things that- call, Gabriella, um, I oh. see questions and stuff coming up and obviously, uh, you know, I don't want to be rude and not respond. Can we respond afterwards? Yeah, yeah, we can respond afterwards. We'll get to, we'll get to everyone, even if it's a follow-up after the webinar, but- yeah, when it comes to implementation, we do have a question here that really ties into what what you were saying about accountability and and buy in, because from my perspective, you know, it takes typically at a firm, you know, your data import with 400 cases and years and years or 400 employees and years and years of data. You know, your migration took over six months. Typically, it's, you know, within eight to 12 weeks for a typical a typical law firm. And in terms of getting started, we worked with you guys for months ahead of time to make sure that you had everything in place before you started. But it really is a top down approach. I have also onboarded firms back in the day, especially when we were still learning how we were encouraging firms to adopt case fear. And you'd have the, you know, the business owner really excited about the technology and really excited about the data. And then you have a revolt on the staff and they say, I'm not going to use it. And the business owner caves. Uh, yeah. And that's, you just can't do that. No, and I, I, I'll just real quickly go into this. And I know Glenn and I are on the same page of this. Uh, change. It's very difficult to embrace change, especially it's if you've been on ship. With a bigger ship, it's harder to change direction. Especially if you've been on the same software platform for 18 years. And we got some people that have been on that platform for 18 years. Yeah. Um, so changing it up is is always difficult to learn. And um, especially, uh, you know, Case Bear has tasks, an automated task. So it keeps everybody... Uh, or attempts to keep everybody making sure they're doing everything. And um, again, that's back to what Glenn was talking about, accountability. Um, I like using the word, accountability is great, but I like using transparency. And what I mean by that is you can audit yourself with Case Bear. We have, you know, we have conditional additional trainings that we always do. Uh, obviously, I'm running reports. I know some people asking questions, you know, about what type of reports you run, and I definitely can get into that stuff. But um, um, we're running reports, different reports all the time. Um, if it's last contact reports, last client contact is always something we look at besides SOL reports or to run, you know, literally one time a week. So we're on top of those. Um, but you have in these type of reports that you want to make sure your staff is doing what we want them to do. And I think the nice thing is when you bring something that's new in, you talk new software in, you want to talk about being proactive, um, not reactive. I think, you know, over the years, with definitely us, it happens with us, is that you have an influx of, of, potential new clients that are coming into the firm, how are you going to handle them? Um, how are you going to make sure you're maximizing the value of the claim as well as maximizing your service with that client? Um, and that's what I think this software enables us to do. And again, having the pandemic, um, it was very difficult. And Glenn actually hit the nail on the head. You want to talk about a firm, you know, these smaller firms are switching doing this. It's easy if you have four or five employees to just turn around and go remote. We talk about 400 plus in, in 20 plus offices in eight different states, it changes things on how you're gonna do it. It's it's a, I was saying it's like that big tanker ship that got stuck in the, the canal. It's not as easy for us to move getting out of this stuff. So um, it takes a little bit more time for us to do these things. And again, it was nice because it forced Learner and Row to make decisions that are gonna be better for us in the long run, uh, that are making us more efficient. Um, not only with case beer, but other avenues that we're using mm -hmm. to try to make us more efficient um, and more nimble. And to that point, I know that you guys had a lot of employees remote and still do. Do you see, we have a question here. I mean, do you see this as an opportunity for law firms to really be remote? Most people nowadays, they might not want to come into an office to, to sign an intake. They might still want to come pick up a check, right? But maybe not to sign an intake. Well, what, what do you guys think? Get a check. Um, let me answer that for a second because uh, for us, we're such big culture guys. You know, we we believe our energy permeates our practices around the country, and I think we're really good stewards of our people too. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I reckon we're as good of bosses as you're going to get, you know, because I think you also have a different, you have two different types of guys too. You know, you get the guys a little sterner and a little more the taskmaster, Kevin, and you get the guys a fun daddy, and it's a, it's a good mix. 
but we have an amazing office culture. We engage our employees in all the things we do in the communities around America. And people feel like they're part of more than a law firm. And people love working for our firm. The vast majority of people love being there. But people feed off of each other's energy. When people are isolated, they're never going to be. They might get those tasks done, but eventually they need it their battery recharge. And you know what? I long for the days when the girls were just cackling 15 minutes and just talking and everybody's eating cookies. Don't talk about cookies in front of Kevin because that's just <laughs> But But um, you need that. That's your culture. And so all we're focused on right now post-pandemic is getting that culture back. I was in Chicago and we're talking about that. Like, you know, every two weeks we're encouraging our office leads and every one of our office take everybody out to a local bar. Not mm -hmm. that and drunk and stuff but have fun we want yeah. you engaging we need you guys reconnecting we need that energy that's learner and row learner and row isn't these two guys here learner and row is those 400 people that represent us and our values and that are out there loving our clients and mm -hmm. and being us in the community you know and without that without that connection with their fellow employees it's hard for them to maintain that and so we really really been trying to get as many people back in the office as possible we obviously we let people that can't come back and if there are still issues with children or that they're, they're scared of course we're going to make exceptions for people but if you can come back to the office get back in the office come on we want mm -hmm. you back we want you to be invested in what we're building back you know because this yes. we're all coming back yeah there is Absolutely. not one firm in america that's saying they're better than they were a year ago we all took a hit Accidents were down such a high percentage. I'm amazed we kept the percentage of accidents that we got in our markets compared mm -hmm. to you know what was happening on the highways. Ten percent of the people in Chicago were working out of offices. Yeah. Yet our business was only down about 30, 35 percent. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That tells you how strong the brand is. And so mm -hmm. what do you do now? Man, we have we have an advantage. Let's really focus on what we're going to do now as a business in the community. I'm so excited to really be doing some of our stuff we're going to be doing in the communities. You know, we've had two of our golf tournaments already. Um, and, you know, for anybody that listens to us, you know, with our foundation, we have two people in full-time ministry. I call full-time ministry, but two people that are out there in the communities uh, just saying, how can we serve? And for us, it's, it's Christ-based, but it's also just going to be non-denominational as well, and it's secular. And we'll do anything we can in our communities. But anybody that wants to learn how we're doing this stuff, we're happy to send out people out to talk to you because ultimately we're looking to help people. And so, you know, for so many of you guys, especially some of you that are some of the bigger firms in your communities, it's incumbent upon you to be part of that fabric of your community. You just can't take, mm -hmm. you know, if you get involved in your communities, man, it's it's going to make such a difference in in how you're viewed in your community, but really how you're viewed by your employees. You're really going to engage your your employee base. And it gives them a sense say, of, of higher, a uh, higher uh, not power, but a higher being that they're actually doing more than just being a law firm. They're actually mm -hmm. They must take a lot of pride in it. 100%. And we, yeah. you know, uh, we really enjoy, and that's what's really, I think, been hurt when Glenn's talking about culture. I agree 100%. And getting people back in is what we're doing. And yes, we make accommodations for stuff, but I think really that we're excited to be able to do is in Arizona, as everything's opening up and all the other states are opening up, we're getting back into doing our, our charity walks, um, you know, it's for breast cancer or lymphoma or whatever it may be that we always get together on a Saturday that people will bring their families. So we get a chance to interact with them. They're animals, you know, dogs will come running around. It's, it's really fantastic um, to be able to have that opportunity with people uh, that you work with every day. You're spending eight hours or more a day with them. So it gets to see them outside of the office a great setting. So they feel that they're more engaged outside as well too. So we're excited about it. We have our Backpack giveaways that come up. Then we have our turkey drives that are coming up. Then we got our 25 days of giving. Those are all things that we did last year too, but had to change them. And how are they going now? I think we can These really. All, they don't all start big. We feed no. 10,000 families every year now for Thanksgiving, which wow. that's more than and then that's more than the NFL. But it didn't start. We started at 500 or 600, and it worked up to a thousand, mm -hmm. a couple thousand. You know, see, so just year by year, our golf tournament. What? How much you raised in the golf tournament the first time? Uh, $86,000. Now we're raising over $500,000 each time mm -hmm. we do it. 
you know, yeah. but so, and we'd love, to, anybody who wants to talk to us about this stuff, that's yeah, what gets that. us excited. And, yeah. and you guys include people, I know we, uh, we participated in, uh, I think last December in your golf event. And I mean, there's other firms I know that participate. There's, exactly. I mean, it's community wide. It's not something that's competitive. You guys are really bringing people together for, yeah. for something great. Well, yeah, yeah, I know yeah. perfectly. People say it's one of the best corporate events that they've attended. It's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah, you know, yeah, we engage a half hour, a half hour, probably 250, 300 Arizona employees are participating in the event. Mm -hmm. This galvanizes your employee base. It galvanizes your community. You know, we're not just these lawyers chasing ambulances trying to. It's not just transactional with us. You know, it becomes relational in the community. And, you know, we've been named the most philanthropic law firm. I'm uh, not not philanthropic law firm. Philanthropic no. business. Business. in phoenix what six years seven years in a row six years in a row right now it's crazy everybody hates lawyers and they almost like us <laughs> <laughs> no it's uh, and, and you're absolutely right Gabriella. when you said that is uh we enjoy we encourage everybody to come out i don't there is no competition on the days we do this event i mean if you want to come out and give swag and you're a colleague of ours doing it in the same field fantastic do it um the key thing is we want everybody to get together and raise money for the causes that we think are important in, in our cities that we serve. And uh, it's been really great. And every single event's been better, better, and better, at least in our eyes. Glenn's right, we get a lot of positive feedback from the people that come. Um, and I, I have a personal goal that within the next few years, I want all 36 whole sponsors um, to be other offers. I would love it. And again, I, this isn't one of those. It's just showing that we can come together on this day to raise money and help other people in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been it's been pretty fantastic. It's been great. So it's definitely I, I think our staff, myself and I know Glenn are just really proud that we're able to do all this because, again, 100 percent we raise 100 percent goes back in the community. We don't offset expenses or costs. 100 percent this raise goes back so we know we're making a huge positive impact on those cities we serve. well kevin with you bringing that up I mean, maybe case spear can help with that we've got lots of attorneys on this webinar today i think we could uh we could find a couple whole sponsors for you I, that'd be I, fun I would welcome it put every, put every one of your attorneys on this today down for 10 turkeys all right <laughs> No, okay. If anybody wants to know really what we do um, and get and learn more about what we do, go to learnerandrowgivesback.com. We post mm -hmm. there and obviously on all our social media stuff of all the activities we're doing in the community. I encourage anybody, if you're in any one of the areas that we're actually doing at events, come on out. Let us know you're coming. Um, uh, we love meeting with new people. We love spreading what we're doing. And we just want everybody to be a better version of themselves. And we know that we've been blessed with the opportunity um, uh, with the opportunity to have a positive impact on people's lives professionally. And I know we're doing it in our personal lives as well, too, with part of our foundation and stuff. So truly, truly excited about that. I, I love that. Kevin, we actually have a couple questions that are in a vein of employee incentive programs and sure. motivating employees financially. And I know you guys do things that maybe some firms don't. Are you guys comfortable talking about that a little bit? Sure. So I, I know there's one question on here. How do you pay your attorney salary based commission only or both? We do both. They have salaries. Mm -hmm. and it really depends what uh, area they're in. And what I mean by that, if you're a pre-lit pre attorney is a different salary than if you're a litigation attorney. Um, but uh, to answer that question, we do both. And then to go to Tammy's question, talk about incentive programs. Uh, we incentivize people across the board. Mm -hmm. Just about every position in our firm is incentivized. So what types of programs? Well, of course, money is a possibility of reaching goals and making money. But another that has really been big and it's resulting from, uh, well, it's actually not, we had it prior to the pandemic, but you've seen a lot of it come out of the pandemic that if hitting certain goals, you have the ability to work remote once a week, you know, uh, a couple times a month. And depending as long as your workload doesn't come down and you're still hitting your goals, then we allow that as well too. So I think there's, um, yeah, potentially having additional PTO time and, and stuff like that. We really, um, I'll tell you that as an owner or manager of a business, one thing that I've learned and I, let me tell you, there's a lot of things as we talked about the mistakes we've made, but I think one of the things that I've really, really learned is have the ability to allow your staff give you feedback. Don't think you know everything. Um, be willing to learn and engage. So, you know, when you have a small firm, the old days you used to have the suggestion box in the meeting room or in the kitchen. Well, we've taken that to another level 
and because we have so many uh, staff members that are all over the country, um, we've made it electronically that if you want to send an anonymous email to me and the integrity is, is and honesty is, is there, um, people do it. And let me tell you, have some thick skin, but you want that feedback. Um, I get people telling me how great we are and I get people telling me um, how we're not in touch. So, but it's a way to engage and it's a way to listen. And you have to listen to your staff, especially what's been going on the last you know, 14, 15 months. I mean, it's been really, really you know, engaged. That's one people. thing we get in the employee portal for that. The number one complaint, shave your goatee. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all sent by Glenn, right? <laughs> that's actually, yeah, they're all sent. Well, I don't know. It's anonymous, but you know, I'll check that IP address. No, the funny thing is that you said that, Glenn, is uh, I have a six year old daughter and she came to the office with me the other day. She goes, Daddy, I want to come to the office. And I'd love you to come in. It was great. She wanted to just hang out. She comes in, we park in our parking spot. Right next to us is one of our vans that's wrapped. And she goes, Dad, what is that? And I go, what? She goes, where's your beard? You don't have a beard on that picture. I go, do you like the beard? She goes, yes, don't do that. <laughs> Not understanding, but yes. Uh, you always have your kids and your staff and your partner that brings you back down to earth and make you humble. Mm -hmm. We get it. Yeah. Well, one thing too, we got a couple questions and Kevin, this is another one that might be good for you about kind of case flow and case management. And I know we don't necessarily have time to get into a lot of details, but obviously you and Glenn are both very familiar with all the details that case management entails. And, you know, talk to me a little bit about what that process is like and how you guys have managed that with the volume you guys are doing. Well, I, I think, let me say this is I, Glenn and myself um, have done every position in this firm. And I think when you start a small business, you are doing the intake, you are the attorney or acting as a case manager, you are doing the accounting on the end of it, and you're dispersing the check and then closing the file. You know, when you have, uh, at the time that I started with Glenn, I think we had four or five people, including Glenn and I. Um, so uh, there wasn't a lot, so you get to learn that, and it's pretty important that you learn it that way, uh, and you get in to learn and learn from your mistakes and do that stuff. But. Um, I honestly think about the task from workflow. Uh, I think it's truly important, honestly, to have individuals that are conscientious to try and, I mean, it really comes down to you can't do everything and you need people that one, you have a, um, that you're giving uh, a positive feedback, constructive criticism, but using positivity and acknowledgement. I think that works really well in our firm and having the right people that are gonna be able to care about others and use that compassion and empathy that they have for each and every client. And we try and keep the caseloads manageable because we don't, again, I said this earlier, we don't want people being reactive. Of course, you're always gonna have certain issues that pop up that you have to react to them, yes. But we wanna be getting out in front of it. We wanna be making phone calls and sending emails and, and correspondence before the clients even have a question to us. So we wanna give them all the information and expectations early on. Um, and that starts with having a great, well-informed intake team and attorneys as well then moving into um, your uh, moving into your case managers and your, your co's. So when we talk about case managers, we split that up too. Case managers and what we call co's or CMAs, case managers, assistants, they work with the case managers. They're in charge. They have their own duties they need to do. Um, they don't speak to clients. Case managers and lawyers at our firm are the only two that speak to clients, and that's for continuity um, purposes. But then they're the ones helping everything um, on the back end, ordering medical records, you know, following up on on items that, that uh, are there to help uh, the case manager be more efficient. Then we do things a little bit differently too, is we have a full, what we call distribution team. And that means we have, in Arizona, I think we have 39 or 40, if not maybe a little bit more, what we call lean negotiators. And these are individuals that work under an attorney, a specific attorney that handles this group. Um, that are, they're fantastic. Uh, the attorney that manages this group has been with us for 10 years plus years. Um, and she's really taken to knowing the lien laws out here and they're very well educated and has done very well. And it takes a lot of that pressure and time off the case manager slash paralegal and off the attorney. You know, the attorney's got to review it. By the time he's reviewing it, everything's done. All the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So we've really kind of made the assembly line approach to be what we really like to do. Um, and I think it's been very helpful. Um, um, I, I know there's a couple other questions here. What's a typical caseload for each attorney paralegal? It really depends. Uh, you know, when you look at caseload for um, a, a case manager and assistant, I will tell you they're typically 
you know, between 120, you know, we don't really don't like going over 125 per case manager. Um, and it really depends on the, uh, the attorney and the organization and the ability to handle uh, more than one case manager. Typically every attorney has two case managers that they're under. So they're handling roughly 240, 250 files underneath them with a case manager, two case managers, if you're doing that, and then two assistants that are under that, and then an accounting team behind them. Um, so uh, we try and keep it as low as possible and, and manageable as possible. And that's simply because of the fact we want to be proactive. We want more involvement from our attorneys, more involvement in communication from our case managers, and we want the follow-up to move efficiently throughout the process. And like I said, we couldn't do it without having a software platform like Casper to help us do that. I know people are asking kind of what reports are you doing, what you're running? It, it depends what I'm looking for. So I previously asked, I previously said SOL reports. I previously talked about um, um, uh, last client communication reports. Those are done uh, every week. Uh, we have leads of every department. They run those reports. But remember too, uh, with Case Spirit, these same reports can be run by the individuals themselves. So case managers, attorneys, they can run the same reports that we're running. And I think that's, that's that transparency that you can really do things before we start doing things, meaning auditing things. So client communication is really big. Somebody had mentioned too, can you run reports based on the statuses and how long it's been there? And fantastic enough, we were just having this conversation yesterday. The answer is yes. Um, and it, it's absolutely imperative to do that, I believe. And the reason why I think it's imperative to do that is Typically, you break out, case pair allows you to run the cases um, to the way you like run them. So we have the assembly line approach. So um, you can make your own statuses or modify statuses as you wish. I don't want to put more work on Gabrielle and her team, but you can do that. So when we did ours, we have a lot of statuses. And typically, the biggest phase that, that the cases are in the longest is the gathering record stage. And that's something that stage right there that running those reports for the length of time they've been in there and having a task be performed if they're there too long, you know, and you decide what that is for you. Um, you know, for us, if it's there longer than three months, it tags it for us saying, hey, we got to figure out what's going on. And there may be many reasons. It could be the insurance we're looking for. It could be the hospitals. It could be the multiple reasons. But the whole point is to make sure that we keep the file moving efficiently through the assembly line and through the process. So we definitely use those. We use reports that are telling us how many files um, and what statuses the, the case manager and attorneys are using. Of course, we're using as management, we use reports that are telling us how many cases we have, we're telling values of cases, um, how many cases are out for demand in each location, in each state, you know, what's the value of those demands that are out there at this point. So, and all of that is within case fair. So we use, I, I, I'd be remiss if I sat here, I could probably spend the next half hour going through every one of the reports. I'm looking at my screen, going through all the different management and overview and actual reports that we run all the time. Um, and it's really, you, I, I say once a week, uh, I run reports every single day, but again, I'm not handling all the files either. Um, um, so uh, I run reports and different reports for teams. And, and again, working with Case Peer, uh, you guys have been flexible with us Mm -hmm. um, to allow us to make modifications and changes down the line that I think are definitely going to make us as a well, large a lot more efficient. You know, for us, I think that one of the things that I've really enjoyed working with both of you is that you guys have this vision. And I think that for, you know, we all can get cynical and we all have this sort of, even though, you know, I, I always, you have this image of an ambulance chaser, right? People who we don't have a work commercial with like that. Or, I know, and it's a great commercial and it's so funny. <laughs> and I if you guys so haven't so seen it, I'm sure it. it's on YouTube, right, Glenn? <laughs> it's on YouTube. So close. Yeah, but what I was going to say is that, you know, it. I think that people might have an impression and from the very beginning when we met, I could really see how passionate you are about the client experience, your employee experience and delivering the best possible service, which is really what Case Beer is here to help firms do. And okay. so we value your feedback because the feedback you guys have for us helps us continue to develop and improve the product for everyone across the board. So some of your favorite features for those of you that are tuning on that are 
our case fear clients already. Some of those might be recommendations that came from Learn and Row or some of our other firms that are killing it out there for their clients because we're all becoming better as a community, um, helping each other out and, and sharing advice. And that's what I think I, I, for us, and I know I can say this for Glenn as well, um, we love helping other people. It's not necessarily, you know, if it's people in the community or our staff or our clients, but Glenn mentioned it earlier. Um, we really thoroughly enjoy um, um, helping other lawyers. I, I know Glenn's out with the legal community all the time. People reach out to me all the time. We encourage you guys to do so. If you have questions or concerns, I'll do my best. Because at the end of the day, we're all on the same team. And that's mm -hmm. providing the best experience possible and getting the clients the most amount of money we can possible. And that is using the right software. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's very it's very nice to be able to have that avenue and platform, um, but it's really been nice to be able to work with Case Pure and all the different arenas. Cause look at working with us, there is no status quo. We change all the time because we want to continually get better and push the boundaries. Um, and I think it's been great to work with Gabriella and her team because you got, I mean, prior to this, prior to here, first of all, you were with us yesterday for six, yeah. seven hours. And then even prior to this, I'm going back and forth with you saying, what about this? What about that? Let's change this. And we're like, you're like, I'm getting ready for, ready for a webinar. <laughs> I, I get it. And it's always mm -hmm. thinking of how we can provide the better experience um, for our staff, 100%, but ultimately the clients as well, too. And it's, we're going to continue being that way. You know, uh, once mm -hmm. we see something or once we think there's a way we can do it better or, or you know, the opportunity there, we're going to try it. You know, that's been us. When, when we first switched over to Case Pierre, I mean, it was it was almost a, a rebellion. You know, a lot of people were really, up, you've made a mistake. Why do we use this? Why do we do this? I hate this. I'm going to do this 10 times over. And I think, um, what do we, we're basically a year in July. We'll almost be a year in? Yeah. A yes. year in, I think almost everybody invariably will say that it was a good choice for us. Uh, the mm -hmm. accountability, the the ability to really start seeing where we where we could be better, where we need to focus in terms of reporting, um, analytics. I think we still gonna need help from you in making the analytics more detailed mm -hmm. and better and better all the time. And I think you know we're probably still about six months away from that. And I think every it's any changes we're asking you to make are gonna make everybody else that's on this webinar better. You know, I mean absolutely. Thing, it's just stuff that, you know, through our years, we've gleaned that this is information that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think our people are really happy with it. You know, mm -hmm. it was a transition. It was not an easy transition at all. You're getting you're you're getting a lot of people to change from something that absolutely had no accountability in it yeah. uh, and no reporting. If you weren't doing your job, no one knew about it unless you really looked into that particular case. Now or, with that reporting he has every day, he knows who's being a, you know, who's on Santa's naughty list and who's on Santa's good list, you know? Well, I think it's also, if you go back to the old reporting, we didn't know if you were doing good or not until you went on vacation. You know, or until you're out of the office for a couple of days. Then we know it took over your files. Yeah. <laughs> if you were no longer with the we knew. At that time, we know the damage has been done because the one thing that's critical now for all of us, and everybody that's listening knows this, the client has all the leverage now because you a couple of people asked how much we spent. We spent $30 million a year advertising. It doesn't. Every, every single time we get a, uh, a bad uh, complaint or this and that, it's a ding, it's a ding, it's a ding. And you have to limit those. You got to take mm -hmm. those frowns, you got to turn them into smiles with clients. And that's big. I want to make sure everybody knows we're not saying we're doing everything perfect. Oh, by any means. If you haven't got that across, we definitely are not. You know, our whole team, I, I preach this to our staff every single day, every single staff meeting that we're human, we make mistakes, you admit those mistakes. And then you work your butt off to earn that trust back. And mm -hmm. that's all you can do is making sure the key thing is keep them informed. Don't lie about it. It'll come full circle, bite you even worse down the line. Be honest, keep your integrity, admit where you've fallen, you know, failed to meet expectations or whatever it was that you promised you were going to do. Admit that and then work your butt off to gain it back. That's all we can do as business owners. That's all we can do as humans. And, and I think at the end of the day, you follow those 
little guidelines, you know, look, we, sure, we have negative reviews. Sure, we have a lot more positive reviews and a lot more people that are so happy they haven't even left reviews and won't do it because they're just happy and they won't. You know, mm -hmm. it is what it is. But Glenn is right that obviously tides have changed. Um, and we really work as hard as we can to provide that service. We also have reviews from people that are not even our clients. You know, that's a whole other aspect, which is for another webinar that would take a week long to talk about that aspect of it um, and tracking down IP addresses and going after them and da 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 da. That's another day. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's the price for being out there. I I will share that. You know, we had someone say they RPI attorney because they grew up, you know, with your ads. Which every single time I I take an Uber lift from the airport to visit your office, and they're like, "Oh, Learner and Row. Oh, you know." And everyone has a story of a time they loved an ad, or you know. And it's uh, whether they're young or old, and it really is an amazing. Well, experience. that's the thing that I think starts flipping me out now, or tripping me out. Is oh my god, I used to watch it when I was a little kid. <laughs> what you can say that to Glenn. You can't say that to me. And I realized, I realized, oh my God, this, Father Time has been taken away here. You know, I am that old guy now. Oh, wait till we yeah. start hearing. Oh, my grandparents used to love to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, it must be a it must be a trip. Yeah. Well, um, well, we have a lot of fun doing what we're doing. We love what we're yeah. doing. We love engaging people, and and you know what? We love each other. We love our staff. It's we love it. We absolutely love what we're doing. Yeah. So and we're glad that we have our relationship. I don't think there's anything I'd rather do than what I do. I, you know, obviously at this point in time, you know, um, I've been doing 30 years. Kevin's been doing it, what, 23? Yeah. And you know what? It's, um, it's, I'm good at what I do, and it's nice doing something when you're good at it. You know, I think um, I've, I've learned from a lot of mistakes we've made, and uh, we have fun. We touch a lot of people's lives, and it's a blessing. You know, gosh, I mean, having a life I could never have imagined, but, you know, you've made so many wonderful relationships. It's an interesting business model. And you get to meet yeah. people all over the country and, you know, both of us are people persons, you know, so it's fun for us, you know. Mm -hmm. And so what's next for Learner and Row? What, uh, what are your guys' next big, big plans that you're willing to share with everyone? Post-COVID, I really see... Um, I really see uh, the business model. I see personal injury. A lot of I, I see a lot of consolidation coming to our business. You know, I mean, it's it's never going to be the way it was before. Traffic patterns aren't going to go back to what they were. We had three to four percent of the population were working from home, from home uh, prior to uh, March of 2020. Now they predict it'll be anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. You're taking 20 to 40 percent. I mean, look at it. I mean, it was 90 percent of the people, especially in blue states. So New Mexico, Vegas, Chicago, those offices, I mean, the traffic patterns in, in our offices there, I mean, they were down considerably. You take a considerable uh, percentage of the cars off the road at, at drive time, um, both coming to work and going home, there's less likely a chance of accidents. I mean, you're just not having the same number of accidents. You have people fighting for more cases and a lot of people that have been doing this a long time. I mean, man, I don't want to sit through a rebuild. Let alone technology. On top of all that. Oh, Technology yeah. as well. I really think consolidation is going to come to our business. And you know, we're looking we're looking to always partner up, grow with people, find opportunities. You know, it's we really want to be at the forefront of uh, law firm um, law firm growth. And I think bringing our culture and our management style to firms around the country, I think we have a really healthy way of managing firms, of uh, building culture, and taking what other people have built and just taking it to another level. Because, you know, mm -hmm. I, I looked at a lot of practices around the country with the opportunity to maybe get involved, buy them, whatever. And, you know, it's very easy to look at other people's practices and see all the mistakes they've made. And then, you know, it, you ignore a lot of the same mistakes you're making on your own. So it's really great when I get to look at people's practices and you become very introspective because that's all I am. I don't, I'm never complacent. And I come back and they say, Kev, you know, I saw this, this, and this. Man, we suck. We need to do this, 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 and this. <laughs> we need to fix this and this, you know? And it's you're just always trying to be better. That's and that's it. it. Yeah. I right think there. that's the one word. That's all I ever say. Every time I speak to people in different offices, we need to be better. Just, yep. yeah, but we, all right, well, we have a record-breaking month. Great. Mm -hmm. We need to be better. Yeah, we had another record-breaking month. We did great, and we made this month great. We need to be better. Yeah, we use, <laughs> use the term. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. We absolutely, you know, oh, we heat on everybody. You're amazing. We love your staff. you. Here's money. Here's your bonus. Be better. Yeah. I, we use the be better, be better terms. We use never enough because we always, again, that's 
in our DNA. We mm -hmm. always want to improve, improve the experience, improve the results. Um, at the end of the day, you can't be static. Yeah. And would you attribute that drive to where you are today? I mean, you, nothing was ever good good enough by the sound of it. No, attention deficit disorder for sure. My <laughs> <laughs> I can't stay focused on anything. Okay. Oh, we're doing well in Arizona. Let's go start a new market. Oh, we're doing well in Arizona. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go to Anchorage, Alaska. Absolutely. Absolutely. My wife I love 14 it. times in uh, 22 years of marriage. That's a fact. Yeah. Wow. And he just moved again just recently. <laughs> so, I mean, along those lines, I was going to ask you guys, you know, you obviously it takes a lot of drive to get to where you both are today. What what motivates you? <laughs> Kevin, is there something specific that helps you get out of bed in the morning and hit the ground running? Yeah, I don't want negative reviews. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, look, it's not money. If that's I, I've had four conversations with. Um, one was a new attorney uh, and three were either in college or, or law school looking to be an attorney in the last two weeks. And the first question I asked is why? You know, because they want feedback from me. And the first question I asked is why? Why are you going to do it? Uh, and obviously answers change and who they're talking to. So they're trying to make a good answer. Um, but if it has anything to do with money, this isn't necessarily the field. If, you're, if, you're, if that's your sole motivation, then this isn't it. Personal injury isn't it. Um, it. It's not about money. It's about the relationships you've made along the way. It's about what positive impact that you actually have on on your clients and others around you. And um, if you think of it that way, that when I wake up every morning, what kind of a positive impact I can have on others and who those others may be. It could be a client. It could be staff. I also come in every morning with the idea, I want to learn. I don't know everything. I don't care if it's a receptionist that has something to tell me, or if it's a back office assistant that's got something, a new idea. Listen, you can't close people off. Uh, my other thing that I, I think comes a lot with young attorneys, um, chips on your shoulders. I'm an attorney. You do what I say. We've had that quite often over the years. Um, you're an attorney. Congratulations. You got ESQ. You passed the bar. But you don't have the power to make somebody do something. Actually, no one has that power. Well, maybe my mom and dad did, but I think I fought back on that quite. Or maybe our wife. Um, but um, you have the power to give advice. You know more information than the other person does. Um, so give them advice. You can't force them one way or the other. Just give them the advice, the best advice you think you can give them. Let them make the decision. If they make a decision that's different, give them pros and cons. But if they decide to go with that, that's their decision. You can't force them. Young attorneys a lot of times want to force the issue. Are you listening to me? I'm the attorney. It's not that way. That may have been that way in the 70s and 80s, but it's not that way now. Um, there's a lot of information at a lot of people's fingertips, you know, with Google and all that other stuff. So you got to make sure uh, why uh, um, why you're providing that information uh, and why you're providing that advice and to just do the best you can. And I think at the end of the day, um, that has me in the office every single day wanting to help people make others better, make us better. Um, and look at, you know, Glenn and I'll say this over and over again. We're not perfect by any means. I think every day we find I'll something. Do that. What's that? You'll say that. <laughs> uh, well, Glenn, yeah, Glenn what about... Thing. I'd like to interject one thing because I'd yeah. love you to talk a little bit about uh, the marketplace that you want to put together mm -hmm. on KSPF because I think that's going to be a wonderful opportunity for, you know, one of the big reasons we actually got involved with KSPF was the ability for the firms to work together. Right? You know, when you're a larger firm like us, obviously you start developing large referral networks around the country. And even that's always difficult because even all we have almost every state in america covered for referrals when we get cases and we have great relationships some we're very close with but tracking that case in those offices we're still back in the stone age of hey jim uh i got the jones case the thomas case and the Pazlinski case can you give me the status on them that's no i mean that's a killer of time for my guy chris saxma who handles it in chicago it's a killer of time for joe in their office in arkansas who's doing it but with case pair if we work with referral attorneys on case pair bang mm -hmm. we have god mode we can see the status we can track and for me i'm a huge tracking guy because i want to i want accountability all the time and i want to be able to forecast 
I want to know the status of the case. So we know it's coming up for settlement. We know where our cash flow is. You know, and for attorneys out here that don't know that word, the most important word, if you come out of anything today, is the word cash flow. You need to understand the concept of cash flow because that is the principle of this entire personal injury business model, especially in single events. It is a cash flow business model once you understand that concept and you can do that. That's the difference between this and mass torture, almost anything else. You can build a sustainable business model that's continuously cash flowing. So when someone says to you, hey, your overhead's 300,000 a month, how do you sleep at night? And you answer them, because I have cash flow. You know? <laughs> so that's it. I love, I well, love you guys are trying to build with the marketplace. And I, you know, I urge you guys to really focus on that and get that done sooner than yeah. later. Because I think that's going to be one of the greatest opportunities for all the users to be able to work with one another, post cases on there, that we can help clients in different jurisdictions and vice versa, and be able to track those cases without inundating the referral or referring firm with emails what's the status and that's that's a beautiful thing you provide that god mode to be able to run that case as if it were in your own system we get system. really excited about the potential of case fear being a community where the client wins right wherever you are if you've got a client call or someone's family member who lives in a different state reaches out to you because they had such a great experience with your firm sharing that case across the board making that easier that's definitely something that that we envision and and we look forward to, to working with all of our clients on that good absolutely yeah. i know there's right. i know there's a lot of questions and i know we're not going to go and an answer each individual one mm -hmm. live right now but if you guys want feel free to reach out you know, uh, you know, I can answer, Glenn can answer, uh, both of us can answer. Um, our emails are on our website, learnerinarow.com. Um, um, so feel free to reach out there if you want to reach out to Gabriella. She can forward it to you guys or to us. Um, and again, Absolutely. we'd love to help you out in any way, shape, or form. I, I, we don't have the magic ball or we don't have the magic touch, you know, to say it's this or that. Um, you know, I'll give you the answers to, uh, to, to try and help you the way I would do it. And then you figure out what works best for you or how you want to proceed from there. Wonderful. Well, Kevin, Glenn, thank you so much for being here with me today. Any any last words from you, Glenn? Or, uh... Yeah, I, I saw one question. How did you get so many awards? <laughs> and um, yeah, Kevin paid for them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, so for no, those follow-up okay. questions, Kevin. I thought you were going to question this right here, but you haven't, you haven't said anything on this one yet. <laughs> <laughs> those, are my, those are my thousand dollar bar candies that I oh. somebody gave me in the office because my team lost last night. I'm looking and, for I'm looking for a new partner in about five years. Uh, Kevin has too much of a sweet tooth. I don't think he's going to make fifty five. <laughs> <laughs> All Thank right. You. Well Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Such a pleasure. And definitely, guys, send over your questions. I'll pass them on. And, and thank you for being part of the Case Beer community. Thank Thanks you. so much for listening. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.